to Alessandra. Thanks a lot, Charles. Everybody hear me? Why don't you try it again, Alessandra? Uh, Brian? I'm talking, yeah. Have the volume. Hi. So I take it no one can hear Alessandra? Can you hear me now? I'm trying to scream in the microphone. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, here we go. Sorry about that. Okay, it's very nice to be here for this webinar series. And this is a great opportunity for me, and I recognize several of the names at the participant list, which is really nice. So please allow me to thank you all for joining today's webinar, and I will try during the webinar to keep an eye on the chat box. So in case of any problem, please know. And at the same time, I'll, I will also try to, when I switch to a new slide, to wait a few seconds before starting to talk in case we experience any or further delays in the voice. So, before we start, please allow me to thank my co-authors for the study that you will hear about during the webinar. So, Dr. Brian Palik and Dr. Crystal Kern from U, uh, USDA Forest Service, not research. Uh, Professor Anthony D'Amato from University of Vermont, Dr. John Bradford from United States Geographic Survey, and Dr. Sean Fravor from University Okay, here is the outline for the webinar. We will have a little introduction on prescribed burning in the context of a changing climate, and then we will see something about fire prone forest ecosystems with a focus on red pine. Then I will present you the case study, the main body of this webinar. So we will see a very interesting red pine prescribed burning experiment in Northern Minnesota. Then we will go through the methods, some results, and finally discussion and conclusion. Prescribed burning, what is prescribed burning and how does it work? So prescribed burning is a management tool, and it consists in the deliberate application of fire to forest fuel to achieve specific goals. This application of fire needs to follow specific and detailed prescription, for example, malady and frequency. Why prescribed burning? Prescribed burning, as I said, is usually um, he has specific goals. Among this goal, we can have fuel reduction, promotion of forest regeneration, ecologic and restoration, biodiversity conservation, and so on. Here are a couple of examples from Europe. So the picture in the picture on the left, you see is from northern Sweden, from a natural area where prescribed burning is used as a stand density reduction tool, while on the right side, you see both are from northern Italy, where when, it's al when allowed, uh, prescribed burning is used as a fuel rod reduction tool. So prescribed burning has a well-recognized impacts on several features of the ecosystem. So it can have impacts on the forest structure, soil and nutrients, seed banks, understory vegetation, but also overstory. As important as prescribed burning are fire-prone forest systems, where this management tool can really play a very peculiar and important role. In this case, we will focus more on red pine forest. So red pine is one of the most extensively planted species in the northern United States. Its main distribution is centered out around the Great Lake and the St. Lawrence River. 
red pine is generally the dominant over so red pine forests undergo two decades of wildfire, wildfire suppression this has led to alteration to forest structure and composition and before this active suppression by humans uh, in red pine forest surface fires were common turn into five to fifty while crown fire were pretty infrequent up to one hundred hundred and fifty so the suppression of the fires in this forest and we so beside altering the uh, forest structure and as also in live and dead fuels so this has raised concerns about severe fires that has behavior outside the historical range. This assumes particular importance and according to climate change scenarios, which predict that we are moving toward a more fire-prone climate. Uh-oh. Hear me anymore? I think you just need to speak as loudly as you can. Yeah, I'm almost screaming. I don't know <laughs> what to do. Well, let's see. I was saying that this assumes particular importance according to climate change scenarios, which are predicting that we are moving, moving toward a more fire-prone climate with associated increasing frequency and severity of wildfires. So, especially in this context, prescribed burning can really play an important role by reducing fuels, reducing competition from shrubs and prepare seedbed for pine regeneration while maintaining a productive overstory. But unfortunately, we have few long-term prescribed burning studies available to validate this recommendation. So the effect of prescribed burning on long-term patterns of tree growth still remain poorly understood. In particular, there is little information on how prescribed fire interacts with drought to affect tree growth. So, the study that I'm going to present to you now was aimed to analyze long-term effects, so up to 40 years post-treatment, of prescribed burning on tree growth and vulnerability of growth to drought. The study was located in red pine dominated forests in northern Minnesota, so in, in the United States. And we used the combination of long term plot measurement and dendrochronological data to investigate our research question. Moving to our research question, in general, we wanted to examine tree growth response and drought vulnerability in relation to prescribed burning treatments. Specifically, we wanted to investigate how prescribed burning influenced red pine basal area growth and how prescribed burning influenced growth responses of trees during, during subsequent drought events. The study site, as I anticipated before, is located in red pine forest in northern Minnesota, so we are in the Chippewa National Forest inside the cut food experimental forest. And really this study that we, we did took advantage from the presence of a, the red pine prescribed burning experiment that was established in 1959 by the USDA Forest Service. So the original goal of the red pine burning experiment was to analyze the impacts of prescribed burning on regeneration woody shrub encroachment, fuel reduction, and soil characteristics. The forest naturally regenerated after fires that occurred in the late 1860s. The experiment started with a stem density reduction via thinning from below that was implemented during the winter of 1959 and 1960. So all the stands were thin to a basal area of 28 meters square per hectare to obtain uniform overstory condition. After this thinning, no other thinnings occurred. 
So during the active period of the experiment, so between 1960 and 1970, a combination of frequency and season of prescribed burning was applied. Here are some historical photos from the 1960 from the red pine burning exper prescribed burning experiment, just to give you an idea of how the forest looked like at that time. So you can see a general picture of the area in the upper left, and then a photo taken during a burning treatment in the bottom left. And on the right side of the slide, you see an example of pre- and post-burning condition. So for the study that I'm presenting you today, two burning treatments were selected from red pine prescribed burning experiment. The first one on the left side of the photo, a periodic burning that was burned twice at the beginning and at the end of the experiment, so in 1960 and in 1970. On the right side, the other treatment selected was an annual burning that it was burned 11 times during the duration of the experiment, so between 1960 and 1970. So for this study, we also specifically selected two controls. Both controls are in the Chippewa National Forest and in proximity of the burning experiment. So we are, again, in red pine stands that also naturally regenerated after the fires in the late 1860s. The first control, the picture on the left, was selected as a reference for the thinning of 1959. So this control is part of a long-term growing stock study. In the stand selected for this study were and are still periodically thinned to a basal area of 28 meters square per hectare. And this was since 1949. Uh, this control was also thinned in 1959, but no burning ever occurred in this control. The other control, the photos on the right, um, was selected as a managed control. So the stands here were neither tin nor burn, and no other management ever occurred. Um, in 2010, uh, 11 circular plots were established. And inside the plots, all trees bigger than 10 centimeter in diameter at breast height were measured. The overstory data collected were species, the BH, height, vigor, and other characteristics. For all the trees within the plots, we collected cores. And the cores were mounted, prepared, processed, and measured following standard dendrochronological procedure. The dating and ring width measurements of each series were checked for errors with time series correlation analysis with Coveta and ring width chronologies were converted in annual tree basal area increment, which was then the metric that we used for the following analysis. Among the analysis that we perform, we examine growth changes according to the equation formalized by Novacci and Abrams in 1997. Basically, with this method, Growth changes expressed as a percentage are detected running comparison of sequential 10-year average basal area increment. We analyzed growth response to drought events based on resistance, resilience, and recovery. For resistance, we, def we define resistance as the capacity of trees to avoid growth reduction during a drought event. And the resistance was obtained by the ratio between the average basal area increment during drought and the average basal area increment prior to drought. Uh, for the period post and prior drought, we used one, three, and five years 
time window. Moving to resilience, resilience uh, describes the ability of trees to regain pre-drought growth following a drought event. And it's defined as the um, average basal area increment following drought divided by the average basal area increment prior to drought. Finally, recover, recovery um, is the increasing growth following drought-induced growth depression. So it is obtained as the ratio between the average basal area increment following drought and the average basal area increment during drought. We selected six drought events for our analysis. So droughts were selected based on historical and meteorological records and were characterized by the standardized precipitation evapotranspiration index, the SPEI, which is a drought index that was developed by Vicente Serrano et al. in 2010. Um, <clears throat> the first event selected, so 1948, allowed us to evaluate drought responses before the establishment of the burning experiment. The second and the third droughts, so years 1961 and 1970, gave us insight on drought response at the beginning and at the end of the experiment. While the three last droughts analyzed, so 1980, 1990, 2006, allowed us to examine drought response in the long term after the end of the burning experiment. So here we go with some results. We start with the um, growth changes. So in the um, upper graph, you see three level basal area increments through time. This graph uh, shows you how three level really growth really flat Situated markedly over time in all treatments. The lower graph instead is the result of the analysis of on growth changes. Here we see how in both prescribed burn treatments, so in the periodic burning and in the annual burning, we saw um, reduced growth following the beginning of the experiment. And in the annual burning especially, most of the trees, so more than 90%, experienced more than 25% of growth reduction until 1964, minus 31% in average. If we move, if we analyze the end of the experiment, we see that in the annual burning, uh, the annual burning stands experience reduced growth after the end of the burning experiment, but this reduction was significant only for a few years. Okay, moving to growth response. Uh, here I will show you the result based only or on a three-year window or of prior to and post drought uh, period. So this result are consistent. The results from the one-year window and the five-year window are consistent with those from the three-year window. Before the experiment, so drought events of 1948, we did not see any significant difference in terms of resistance, resilience, and recovery. If we move to the during the duration of the burning experiment, we saw the droughts analyzed in 1961 and 1970. We saw that in general, both burn treatments, so the periodic burning and the annual burning, responses were altered by the burning. On the contrary, both controls did not display uh, particular fluctuation in resistance, recovery, or resilience during this time frame. So now looking at resistance, so the capacity of trees to avoid growth reduction during a drought event, we see how uh, both at the beginning and at the end of the experiment, in both 
the periodic burning and the annual burning resistance decreased. And uh, the annual burning showed its lowest values of resistance at the beginning of the experiment, so in 1960. Moving to resilience, so the ability of trees to regain tree drought growth following a drought event, we see how resilience was reduced at the beginning of the experiment in the annual burning. But the most, the most notable reduction in resilience was observed in both the periodic burning and the annual burning at the end of the experiment, so in 1970. Looking now at recovery, so the increase in growth following drought-induced growth depression, we saw how at the beginning of the experiment, recovery was increased in the periodic burning, while at the end of the experiment, the recovery decreased in the annual burning, the annual burn stand. Looking at the long-term uh, response drought, so analyzing drought years of 1918, 1919, and 2006, we did not, we just noticed little differences among treatments in terms of resistance, resilience, and recovery. Moving to some discussion, we saw how repeated prescribed burnings really reduce growth but just in the years immediately following burning without long-term consequences. So basically, the impacts did not proceed after the burning treatment was discontinued. Drought reduction was more pronounced in the stands that were burned annually than those that were burned periodically. But even though it was just significant for only a few years after the burning. Similarly, growth vulnerability to drought was altered by the application of repeated fires. So resistance and resilience to drought mainly were reduced in both burning treatments in the short term, but without long-term consequences. In conclusion, based on our results, the use of prescribed burning can increase tree growth vulnerability to drought over the short term, but without, no, without long-term consequence. Given this susceptibility, the use of prescribed burning as a forest management tool it needs to be consciously implemented, especially considering prediction of increasing drought frequency, duration, and intensity for many forested regions around the globe. For driving for drier ecosystem, then the application of alternative fuel treatment, like for example mechanical treatment, could be an option for achieving fuel reduction goals, but without affecting tree vigor or without increasing tree growth vulnerability to drought over the short term, as it was already studied and proved in other sites, like for example in the Western United States. Those are just some of the references that I use in this presentation. And uh, with this, I really would like to thank you for your attention and again joining for joining this webinar. I'm really sorry about the voice. It was not clear for all the time. But if you have any questions, I think you can type them in the chat box. So thank you. Thanks, Alessandra. Um, while we have some people typing here, I guess I can ask a question or two. Um, yeah, sure. So the, the control stands that you used, um, can you speak to the, um, how similar they were in terms of soils and um, landform? Because they okay. actually weren't directly adjacent or Part they were of the not same the area basin, treatment, they correct? Were, they were pretty close by. So the soil there are more sandy soil. I'm not a soil expert, and I apologize about that. So I don't know much about the soil. But all the analysis we rounded, the comparison we did, 
So the diameter distribution, the age distribution, the origin of the stands were similar, and also the growth in terms of rank width and the increments similar through time. Okay, great. So um, why do you think the prescribed burning increased drought sensitivity? Was it damage to fine roots, something else? Um, can you expand on the yeah. potential mechanism? So um, <laughs> that's a good question. So as you see, let me go, can I go back with the slide? Sure. No, well, I don't. So as you could see, the understory condition in the two different burning treatments that we analyzed were different. So it is likely that also the understory composition and should, oh, what's I'm doing that, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. It this is, is like the slide you want? Yeah, not the one before. This one. Okay. So if you can see, there are differences in the understory. So one of the reasons that could have influenced this differences in vulnerability could also be in the long term also the differences in development or understory. But we did not focus our study on that. But I have to tell you that there is a master student now that is working on this kind of aspect of understory, soil, litter, and fuel. So we will likely know more about it, and which could be also the driving uh, variables of this trends that we observed. Is there is there information available on the the fuels and the fire behavior over the ten years that? Um, the sites were burned annually or periodically? So there we have information also on the fuel and the so fine materials divided into different classes of fuel. But as I said, there is a master student that is working specifically on this topic, so it will surely have more information here hopefully soon. And um, Um, so here's another question. How yeah. different is tree density between the treatments today? Seems a little surprising that the basal area increment was so similar between treatments in recent years. So the tree this density is pretty similar nowadays in both the prescribed burn because the mortality in the mature trees was observed at the end of the, ex the burning experiment was not significantly different between them. And sure, the density, if you consider trees that are smaller than 10 centimeters in diameter, it is different. But we focus our study and our research on mature trees that were mature and already present at the time of the burning experiment. All the smaller trees that you can see, for example, in the picture, they originated after experiment. So going back to the original study, um, were, what were, were the goals to look at regeneration or controlling fuels or? Yeah, um, both. So oh, they okay. Were and is there, are there hazel issues yeah, in these stands? Yeah, exactly. That was, um, main issue, so the, one of the goal of the study was to how prescribed burning could affect, uh, could promote pine regeneration and uh, contrast the presence of shrubs, hazel, that was the main issue at that time. And also they were interested in studying um, the effect on soil characteristics on shrub, on woody. Great. Um, any more questions from the audience here today? Another new. Um,
All right. Well, I don't see anybody um, typing anything in right now. So um, if there aren't any, oh, here we go. Um, we have a question here. Um, is there any information on nutrient cycling at your sites in terms of dissolved organic nitrogen and carbon? Yes, the answer. So they conducted studies on soil uh, nitrogen, carbon, and soil characteristics. And they published studies about it, like if you look at Allen and Bookman publication about the red pine burning experiment. But this is nodding. I work, so I'm probably not. Like we have potentially another one coming in. Oh, the conclusions page back up on. This, yes. Okay, um, so I think we'll probably wrap things up. Um, there aren't any other questions. Um, appreciate and thank you, Alessandra, for um, providing a very interesting webinar here today. And I'd um, like to thank everybody for, for joining us this afternoon. If you'd like to review the webinar um, or share with somebody that might be interested but missed it, um, we will have a recording up of the webinar available at lakestatesfireside.net um, later this afternoon or tomorrow. Um, the, um would also like to just um, announce to everybody that on March 19th um, at 2 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Central, we have Byron Stearns of the Huron Manistee National Forest um, in Michigan from the Huron Shores Ranger District district leading us through a webinar on fire monitoring, fuels, vegetation, and fire behavior examples from red and red pine and jack pine um, prescribed burns. So that webinar link will, is also available on the Lake States um, Fire Science Consortium website and uh, will be included in our February newsletter and announcement emails. So appreciate um, everybody joining us today and a special thanks again to Alessandra um, we definitely appreciate it, and I hope everybody has a great rest of the day. And if you're here in the east and the northeast, you're trying to stay warm. So thanks, everybody. Thank you.